58 personnel, seven direct reports, and up to five levels of management concurrently. This is both his practical experience and his consulting repertoire. He has had experience in putting his consulting and academic theories into successful practice with more than 30 years ex executive, senior, and mid-management, including intensive experience in domestic and international projects. He has established a record and reputation of surpassing desired results. Mr. Dirks is renowned turnaround master as an employee and as a consultant. He has repeatedly, consistently helped companies move from losing position into profitable status within months, developing strong teams and planning for continuing improvement are key elements of his management style. He holds an advanced degrees in industrial psychology as well as an MBA. He was distinguished military graduate at Loyola, Loyola. Loyola University and completed the prestigious Ruger's University Advanced Management course for senior and executive managers. Further, he is a certified OSHA outreach safety instructor and certified food service manager. Let's welcome Mr. Dirks. Thank you. To give us a I appreciate that. Little kicker there. All right, now let me give you a practical demonstration that teamwork is really of great value. I have here $2. Can't even buy a gallon of milk at Kroger's for two dollars. But if they work together as a team, they can build greater value. I'll demonstrate that by them folding in unison as a team. So they fold as a team. Again, they fold as a team. They fold as a team, and now they're worth twenty dollars. Yeah. <laughs> teamwork. That was teamwork. But I want to remind you, this twenty-dollar bill was the result of the two. Hard working one dollar. <laughs> Teamwork, it's real. Okay. Today we're going to talk about a specific opportunity to add to your repertoire. And it can make you a much more value added accountant or CPA. And it will give you a better relationship with your prospective clients, especially in the trades and fabrication and manufacturing. This is a, a system that is really important to them. So, so welcome to Value Added Operations Accounting Methods, presented by Diet Consulting and written by myself. Okay, operations accounting, what it, we're gonna go through these course objectives, learn what that is, consider the value to the client in setting up operations accounting, address chart of account strategies, Learn what payroll items should be considered to be changed or added. Learn why you improve productivity by helping the client pay attention to their overtime, their bill versus unbilled hours, waste and rework. A lot of my clients don't measure that separately until they have me for a coach. Okay, improve your effectiveness as an accountant, CPA, add operations accounting methods to your repertoire. Consider how to introduce this approach to your clients. So that's what we're going to try to accomplish today. At any time, you're welcome to ask questions. I'm easily interrupted. I'm not bothered by it, okay? That's my personality type. Other personality types that would drive nuts, but I'm okay with it. So feel free, please. Now, remember that time is money, said Benjamin Franklin in 1748, advice to a young tradesman. This will come back into our purview a little bit later. So what is operations accounting? Well, there's no formal gap definition of this, although this should, if it's done right, it should can still uh, comply with gap. It's just a little bit of different breakout and tweaking uh, payroll items and the chart of accounts. Most small and medium businesses have their chart of accounts set up primarily for tax mitigation, as well as investors, if they even have investors, and banking concerns. It's how their bank and their CPA sets it up for them. They don't really take any additional advantage out of it except to have 
good records for taxes and good records for the bank to give them the line of credit, etc. Operation account accounting maintains these strategies and adds further breakouts of financial data that provide insight into how the operations are performing. Operations accounting seeks to measure operational key performance indicators and therefore they become um, a part of the strategic plan that guides the future of the business via business operations as well as via their finances. They're both important. Operation accounting modifies the charter accounts in order to provide more detail in revenue, cost of sales, or cost of goods sold, and expenses. These breakouts are concerned with transactions affecting the impact and efficiency of operations, not just the money. Although money is always important there too. That's how one way you see how the operations are performing is watching how the money is going through the system. But it can tell you if a project's behaving well or not behaving well in various ways. So both types of accounting, as I said before, are very important. They work together. You don't just use one or the other. You use a regular finance accounting, GAAP principles should be applied, and then you add operation accounting as a correlated or coordinated accounting with the financial accounting. Is that making sense to anybody yet? Mm -hmm. Can you accept that probability? Okay. So what you, you need a combined and coordinated accounting setup in order to prompt timely action on critical financial factors and to ensure sustainable profitability and growth. So you want to be able to see your data fast enough that you can make adjustments. So if a project's going south, you don't want to learn about it when the project closes, which is a problem a lot of my small businesses have. They don't figure it out until it's too late. So what I get them is look at every payroll period, whatever that is, if it's every week or every two weeks, they're going to look at their financial data. And what I want my clients to do is get them to review their financial records with their accountant or CPA every month. And then every quarter and they use different perspectives to adjust different things like overhead you want to check that every quarter is the overhead factor they're using to bid their work is it really effective is it viable or is it assumptions that aren't supported by factual data well we're going to set up their chart of accounts and teach them a few additional formulas maybe give them some spreadsheets to supplement to keep up with what the true overhead factor is, what their true labor burden is, and things along those lines. And they have a much more information and much quicker information to adjust things like project management, client relationships even. Which clients are the clients you really want to spend time on? Or which types of services do you really want to spend your time on? Is this type of client even worth the headache? I've worked with companies including one time as a controller for a, a construction company, we reduced our revenue from over 18 million to less than 14 million, but improved a million dollar loss into a $400,000 profit within the first year of that reduction. Because we got rid of the types of projects that didn't earn us money. They were nice and juicy, Chicago, low hanging fruit, million dollar, two million dollar project, but they never paid us on time and we never made any profit. So why go through all that headache? So we started focusing on suburban municipalities who paid on time and we made a profit. So it went from 18 million to less than 14 million, but made money. What are you in business for if you're not there to make money? It doesn't matter how much revenue you want. The only reason you want more revenue is because it improves your overhead factor and it improves the ratios. So it makes your bidding more competitive because if you've got making a lot of money and it's covering the uh, less overhead, your overhead factor has to be less so you can bid actually a little bit lower on your hourly wage. And we can get that another time. Operational accounting consulting starts with analysis of the accounting entries, the financial reports, accounting policies and procedures that the client has. So you take a look at what they have that's working, whether, well, of course, too, you want to see if they're following generally accepted accounting principles or not. And if they're not, you want to get them into that mode. 
and that'll serve them well in many ways. And then you also want to make necessary corrections and adjustments that are complemented by revised policies and procedures that allow the business to operate more efficiently and effectively. Now, I think the most capable clients have a good accountant on their side. Number one, for the outside perspective. Number two, for the best tax mitigation possible. And number three, they often can have a lot of information and training capabilities that will make the client a smarter, much more financially savvy business owner. So I really like getting my accountants up to speed and in this mode because they can really add a lot to that client. So I'm all for making the client more powerful in many ways, and I don't need all the money for myself. It, it's about making money for the client. But sometimes you have to spend money and make money, right? And I think spending money on the right CPA or accountant is very important. So we want proper, accurate accounting. I think it is the lifeblood of business. And accurate and relevant accounting procedures allow for the opportunity to affect uh, all aspects of the business efficiently and effectively. Operation accounting will help improve productivity, and I'll show you that in a little bit. It is somewhat rare CPA that really does operational accounting. They're mainly brought in to make sure the taxes are reasonable and to make sure they're not doing anything illegal financially and to help them get the maybe loans with the banks. But it's because that's all they've been asked to do, but the business owners don't know to ask for more. But if you understand what you can do more for them, it will embellish, not embellish is not the right word, but it will enhance your relationship with them and you'll become more value added to them if you can become their guide to operations uh, management as well as their taxes. Okay, 12 main concepts of operational accounting according to Diet Consulting. Now, there's, again, there's not a formal definition, so other people may have a few different twists, but this is the way I look at it. Analyzing existing operations and correlating operations actions to accounting transactions. So, operations actions to accounting transactions. And one I'm going to show you in the chart of accounts is measuring waste measuring Weeble. I often go and ask my client in the first week of consulting, how much waste and rework do you have? Oh, almost none. It's hardly anything. We rarely do anything. Within a week, my last client, over $12,000 in one week, and I didn't catch everything. It's just what I could catch in a week. $12,000 a week, that adds up, don't you think? It's probably, and it was a lot more. It was a lot more. When we started, we created a chart of accounts for Rework and warranty is what we call it. And when we put everything that was reworked, like they've got they, a trip from uh, Longview, Texas, down to Houston, they forgot to take the pump. Guess what? We had to send somebody in another truck, round trip, to drop off that pump. All that, all those hours plus the fuel and the maintenance, it's rework. It's rework or waste, right? So it all adds up very quickly. They put the head on backwards, so they had to turn it around. That's rework. Well, if you don't measure it, you don't believe it's as bad as it is. Once they started measuring it, guess what? Do you think they wanted to do something about that? When it was hundreds of thousands of dollars that they were looking at? Sure, they're going to look at it. So we use the numbers to show them what they needed to change in their operations. You're understanding the concept? Does that make sense? So, so we're going to revise the chart of accounts to create sufficient, sufficient detail data related to operations performance. We're going to create cost codes in a lot of cases. Not every business needs to do this. But cost codes that reflect all the operations, actions, and transactions that will relate money flow and match up the money to those transactions and those actions. We're going to provide desired breakouts in various reports in QuickBooks and PhDs. These are called items. So if you use those two accounting systems, cost codes is a construction and a, even a manufacturing concept. But QuickBooks and Peachtree or Sage, they call them items, but that's what they are. But you, items can do more than just cost codes, but they're included. That's where you would create them in items. 
So then you also create a few additional payroll items that break out labor costs in desired detail. Like I was saying, if they ran that pump, he, he put his, all his hours wouldn't be in direct labor hours. He would put it in the category that was called rework, regular time, rework, overtime. And it go right into the proper chart account because the payroll item directed it there. Okay. Five, create the related company departmental budgets. So budgeting is an important part of operations accounting. Why? Because it, it starts to see, it doesn't define what the problem is or what the good thing is, but it tells the, the uh, owner to look at something. Why is he under budget so much? Or why is he over budget so much? It, are they <coughs> putting it in the wrong account? Are they using the wrong cost code? Or did they do something really smart that really saved them a lot of time? Well, if they did, what do we want to do? We want to repeat that good thing that they learned. And how did they find it? Because their budget told them something was different. It didn't tell them what, but it told them something was different. So when they started looking at how did it change? Why were we so well under budget? Well, we found out how to use a, a template on the door. So you just hang it on the door and it tells you where to screw it. It goes a lot faster. So we hung doors a lot faster, you see? But if you didn't look for it, you would never have noticed it. The one guy that figured it out, his crew would do well, but nobody else would know about it because they didn't go looking for it. But when they saw they were so under budget, they started looking. And then they discovered how and why, and then took that good thing, shared it with all their other teams, and then it became company practice. And now they knew they could do door hangers, a lot of closers, a lot faster. And that could actually be part of their bid when they needed to. But they also understood what the price will bear. So if they didn't need to lower the price, they could make even more money because they could do it faster but charge the same prices that they, the customers were used to getting. So operational accounting helped them do that. Create a cash flow uh, report that your client understands. They've got to be able to produce it and understand it for it to be valuable to them. But this will help them in many ways keep out of trouble with their bank, avoid banking fees because they know they have to save some money because in three weeks out, we're not going to have enough money to cover the expenses. But if you teach them how to do cash flow and give them a simple tool to use, and I usually just give them a spreadsheet that they download all the uh, accounts payable, accounts receivable out of their QuickBooks or Peachtree or Mass90 even, and then it runs it up to our front page and shows them how it breaks out week to week. Anyways, they've got to understand it, therefore you've got to understand it so you can teach them how to do that. So if you need any additional help, you can get with me after the meeting or write me, and then we'll get together on that. Excuse me, I need to go back. I went too fast for myself. Sorry about that. So we were measured, measured bill versus unbilled, and regular versus overtime. Now if it's billed to the client, I don't care if there's overtime. But if it's unbilled, overtime's the death knell of, of cost and your profitability on a given project. So if they don't measure it though, you think they're going to control it well enough? No. Well, if you don't measure it, you don't, you don't pay enough attention to it. So it's all about measuring, and we're using the accounting system that they already have to get them to pay attention to the costs that are really affecting their business. So bill versus unbilled, why do we care about that? Now unbilled, all the overhead's gonna be unbilled. So they, they know who's overhead and who's not. And if they don't, you tell them. But if it's a direct labor guy that's spending a lot of unbilled hours, you got to do something about that. Either you have too many direct labor people, or they're wasting time and they're doing things like cleaning up shop for three hours one day, instead of just the 30 minutes a day allocated for cleaning up shop. You understand? So if you measure bill versus unbilled, it'll make a big difference and you'll have something factual and data-based that can tell them why they really need to do something different. A lot of my clients, they work on impressions. 
You got to get them to be thinking about facts and data to make their decisions. Make decisions based on data, based on facts, not on impressions. Oh, that's the way my daddy did it. What? And you think it's still good 60 years later? No. We've got to get some data to support how we're making decisions. Okay. So create and or retrieve a work in progress or a process report. Work in process for manufacturing, work in progress for construction. This may not apply to every business, but it really has a lot of information. If you do it right, first of all, it helps their, their cash flow. It can help their taxes at the uh, end of the year in particular. And also, it tells them whether a project is likely losing money or making a lot of money, or whether they're billing ahead of their expenses or falling behind, not billing enough based on what their expenses are. And it also compares, okay, I've, I've used uh, 60 out of 100 hours, but I'm, 70, I'm only 50% uh, done. So something's not going to add up if we keep this pace, so we got to do something about it, right? And that can show up in one of these reports, or you could create a foreman or a supervisor report that would do the same thing. All right, so we want to do a project estimate versus actual report for the type of companies that create estimates or bids. They put it right in their accounting system. Uh, QuickBooks and Peachtree both do this. Other accounting systems do it even better. Um, what's the, well, there's a series, but we'll get into that another time. Uh, but the thing is, you want to be looking at it every payroll again. How is the project progressing? This is the actual, this is how many costs we estimated. These are the actual costs. This is the revenue estimated. This is the actual revenue. Very informative. And if they look at it every payroll period, they're going to have a better chance to keep the project under control at an executive level or project manager level, looking at simple reports. And uh, Peachtree and QuickBooks, for example, Sage 90, Mass 90, will give good reports that they just pull right out of the accounting system. They don't have to do anything extra. OK. Provide adequate training that your client can really understand these concepts. And that's an important part about your relationship. If you're a trainer and you train your client how to use these systems, you think you become more valuable to them or no? Yeah, I think so. You're more valuable to them. You're, giving, you're helping them learn. And you may have to, have to repeat a lot. You may have to drag them kicking and screaming a little bit. But when you show them, the results from doing this, they become believers. That's what you got to do. You just got to show them the results. You got to show them, yes, you do have rework, and it's something you need to do about it because it's going to be $200,000 this year if we keep this at this pace, right? You think they're going to pay attention? Then maybe. I can't guarantee, but most likely they will. All right. Then you need to review the data each payroll period, at least weekly and monthly. That's really the client. You just need to tell them to do that, get them to do that, is a better way to do it, say it. Get them to really do that, and then review it with them every month, every month. Why do you want to review it with them every month? First of all, to make sure they're really gathering the data, make sure they're really doing it. And then add your outside perspective, your less emotional perspective. That's a good thing, they need that, they need that. Real smart small businesses create a group of other business owners, their CPA, their banker, to be like their virtual board of directors. Not legally, but somebody to help them provide advice and guidance and keep them on track. It's just human beings need that. It's a human nature. You need somebody to help you pay attention. When you're the boss, you need somebody else that's not related to the business to help keep you on track a little bit. If you do, they're going to be a much more savvy business owner. Okay, important concepts in operations. Accounting, okay. First of all, the client needs to understand the difference between direct and indirect or variable and fixed costs. Why? Because this is how he's going to understand his break-even point, and this is how he or she is going to understand their um, overhead factor. And overhead is real important to understand it's one of the main things a lot of my smallest business owners don't understand at all. They, they, a classic client for me is, when it was me and my brother, we had two trucks, we were making money hand over fist. 
Now I've got 20 trucks and a whole big crew and I'm losing money like there's a three inch hole bucket in the bucket. So why? Well, because you didn't understand overhead. Now you've got overhead. You didn't have overhead when you and your brother. Okay? Now little mistakes become big mistakes. So little mistakes you could overcome because you're making so much profit without any overhead. And now you gotta maintain all those trucks, etc. Now you got tax litigation. Now you're uh, S Corp and so you got franchise taxes that you didn't have. It's all those little things that they don't understand. <laughs> As I said, it's important for your overhead factor and it's important for understanding your breaking point. I keep doing this. Sorry. Fast finger. Quick draw. Quick draw. <laughs> Amen. Right, thank you. And then they also need to understand a true market because a lot of clients, they say, well, I bid 10% profit on this. Everything went the right number of hours. We finished it on time. I didn't make 10%. Why not? Because if you multiply it just by 10%, that's not a true markup. So I teach them the true markup formula so that they get a true 10% profit at the end of the project, okay? And that's something that they'll be grateful to you if you teach them how to do a true markup. Now, one of the things you'll have to be ready for is convincing them that they can still win the bid. I had all the time. I can't win a bit if I have to charge as much. Well, we have to teach them a lot about the relationship and bidding is more than just numbers. And if you if you want to operate just on numbers, it's a short term thing. You you got to learn to bid on facts. What are your actual costs? What is your true labor burden? What's your true markup? What's your true overhead? If you don't bid it that way, you have an opportunity to what? lose money. You're going to likely lose money, so why do you want to win that bid if you're going to lose money? If you start from a break-even point, you know what your costs are, you know what your overhead is, you know what your market has got to be to get a 10% profit. If you don't, you're either going to erode the profit to less than 10% or to actual negative, depending on how badly you've done. So it's important for them. So these factors ensure the company sees the planned revenue, costs, and the net profit, and as it was proposed in their proposals or bidding. Okay. All right. So some differences between operations accounting on the left and financial accounting is uh, who's preparing the information. It's either the company controller or finance manager versus their accountant for accounting. Internal reports used uh, more often than just the financials, but they I teach them to use the financials as modified. And then financial statements are the primary tools of the accountant. Managers work, who work for the company and officers in the company use it. Uh, for financial accounts, who uses it? Stockholders, if they have them. Creditors, banks, bond companies, and government regulators. Who in the dreaded IRS? <laughs> hey, they, they serve their purpose, but unless you're a conservative. But I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I know what you're but. Okay, weekly, monthly, or whenever needed is what the operations accounting does, and quarterly, annually is what uh, financial accounting usually looks at. Detail, very detailed for operations to address specific decisions to be made by managers, and uh, financial accounting is more general, pertaining to the whole company. Uh, commonly used uh, by companies, but uh, some accounts are rarely used by accountants. They don't really need them uh, for their usual hired purposes. How prepared in accordance with needs of managers and officers versus GAP is how you want to prepare your financial accounting. And uh, different reports that you see use big calculators, job costing, perform project performance, bill versus unbilled hours, overtime hours, cash flow, budgets where accounting uses balance sheets, income statements, capital statements, changes in financial position, which is cash and capital uh, flow statements. Okay. And how verified by internal controls amongst the executive manager and controller, and the CPA will be considered external to that company. I think there's a role for both, as I've been saying. So we're going to revise the chart of accounts in order to create sufficient detail Related to operations performance, some likely additions and changes to the charting costs include 
use of a subaccount to break out certain accounts in more detail that you don't need to break out for tax preparation, but you do need to break out to understand operational accounting. And the accounts that are not often used in financial accounting. So income state changes. Just a couple of quick examples. In the income section, adding an account for each type of revenue by product or service type. So we don't want to just know all our revenue lumped together. We want to know which of our services or products are making real money. What's bringing in the dollars? Okay. You don't need to know that for tax preparation, but you want to know that for management of your business on an operations sense. Cost of sales, subaccounts for each major type of organic labor, material category, subcontractor, consumable supplies, etc. So where is our money really being spent? Which subcontractors, and by the way, another reason you want to break out subcontractors and material types is to have leverage because you're capturing that. I spend $500,000 with you every year. I want consideration for that $500,000. And if you don't give it to me, I'm going to go to another vendor that will give me consideration for that $500,000. If you don't break it up, you don't have that leverage, right? Does that make sense? So that's another reason. Expenses. Adding accounts and sub accounts uh, in order to provide more detailed breakout for expenses. Like, like I said before, an important one to break out is warranty and rework. Equipment repair and maintenance, vehicle repair and maintenance, building repair and maintenance, clean shop, etc. A uh, recent client, when he started breaking out vehicle repair and maintenance and saw how much he was spending on it, he started calculating cost of a new vehicle with a warranty versus the money he was spending on it month to month, and he realized it was time to buy a new vehicle. But would they have made a smart decision if they didn't break it out and didn't know that? No, they would just keep repairing as they were repairing piece of junk because they, they just had it okay so is all this starting to click with you a little bit okay good. on out all right you have in your packet a chart of accounts so i'm going to is there a spare one i'm going to just go with you in the paper and look at it with you this is uh real close to exact chart of accounts that I actually did set up for one of my fabricators. They are metal fabricators that uh, support the sugar, oil, and gas, and petrochemical industries. They build pressure vessels, and they also fix big cooling systems that work on the field oil rigs. Okay? So, bank accounts are pretty standard. That doesn't change much. Accounts receivable is the same. Current assets uh, pretty much the same. These all uh, balance sheet items, they stay pretty close to the same. Maybe, I don't know if you want to break out accumulated depreciation like this, but uh, I, I like to see it. Equipment versus buildings, etc. Uh, other assets, pretty much the same. Current liabilities, well, I break out each one of the uh, payroll taxes and for greater understanding of how, how our costs are going. So that's the only real big difference there. Where we start to see bigger changes now is in equity pretty much the same income. This is where you start to see breakouts. This particular client of mine did a lot of non-taxable as well as taxable work, so we separated each of those out. So he has labor non-taxable, fabrication, field construction, and machinist, and then labor taxable, fabrication, field construction, and machinist. Okay? So let's to see, is the machine shop making any money? Is that worth keep going? Are they making any money? Well, we're going to break it up in the income, or we're going to break it up in the costs, too. So... We can see if it makes sense. And if we didn't break it out, it would be um, hard to spot, hard to understand. So we got labor, material. Uh, I, I sometimes break out types of material if they're like plates. Uh, that would be in the cost, though. I'm sorry. It doesn't matter in the, in the uh, so much in the uh, 
uh, income, but I'll break it out in the cost, you see. So you can see there's a lot more breakout than uh, average tax consultant would. would. Would it be helpful for the warranty and uh, rework to be tied to these various uh, revenue streams? You could do that, yes. So if you want to break out types of uh, types of services as uh, each separate one, I would do that, in fact. I would prefer that. Sometimes this gets a little overwhelming and uh, they don't want to go that deep, uh, but I would prefer that. See, so it matches up one to one. You, whatever in income, you want to see in cost too, somewhere, or cost of sales or, uh, or expenses. Well, it would seem to me like it would depend a lot on the size of your business as to how much detail you really need. I agree with that, yeah. It's a cost benefit for, number one, are they going to make mistakes in coding? Right. Because it's too cumbersome. Is it too time consuming so they're not going to bother period and they're going to lump it all into one category? Yeah, so sophistication of the staff is an important factor I consider when how much breakout I'm going to give them as well. So sometimes they can understand five to seven or maybe even ten payroll items. And it's not that difficult to understand if they did rework, instead of picking direct labor hourly, you pick rework hourly. That's not hard for them to understand, so I get them to do that. But if they're like a small shop and they have one person in the office, period, you're going to do a little bit less because it becomes a factor of time and, and, and complexity they can't deal with anyway. So if, they, if you give them something that would work for a bigger company but they don't have time to do it, it's, it's worth it's there. So I agree with that, that you do have to temper it based on the company. I work with a lot of companies that are five to ten million dollars and this kind of breakout for a five to ten, even over three, I, they, they can do this because they usually have the staff to, to handle that. I had another question. Well, so when you want to measure your rework and your waste, um, what the thought that came to my mind is the guy who forgot to put the pump on the truck Right. Is he the one that's coding in his hours? No. How does that work? Because his supervisor. His supervisor is verifying. Sometimes some of my clients, in fact, a lot of clients that have supervisors, foremen, and supervisors, they do the timesheets, not the individuals. They do the timesheets. If the individual does the timesheet, the foreman or supervisor in my clients, for my clients, is always revi reviewing them for accuracy. And that would be the person responsible to make sure it went into rework instead of into direct labor hours. Now the employee, he doesn't have big reason to, to really cheat except that he might get in trouble. But he, he's going to get paid the same. But it does help them be a little bit better policing their own actions though when they get some heat for forgetting to take that pump. Whereas in the past they would just forget the pump and somebody run out there maybe middle and senior management never even found out about it. Well, when you when you're going 200 miles, though, it's kind of obvious where did where did Joe go? Well, he took a pump down the Houston. Why? You know, it comes out. So, but executive management may never see it because it wasn't reported. There's not a way to report it. If you got a way to report it, it forces them to pay attention to it. And if they know they're gonna, their supervisor is gonna make them put it in rework. That's going to change their behavior pattern over time, too, after they get chewed out a few times. Yes, I have another question. I was wondering, like, when you do this analysis of operations, do you come across much fraud, and, and how would you handle that? Like, like she said, you still want to keep that employee morale, but how do you handle it diplomatically when you, if you do come across it? Well, one of my principles I teach uh, employee empowerment is about making everybody responsible for the company goals. But it's also about not assigning blame, but addressing issues. Make it about facts and figures, lessons learned, not about personalities. It's, and even progressive discipline is about trends. And my progressive discipline, step one in actual formal discipline is what? Not a written or even verbal warning. It's a coaching statement. Because if you tell this is not going to be held in your file, but I wanted to put it in writing because it's important. It has much less emotional impact. So that's a, a side thing to this, but 
teaching people to not make it about personalities, not making it about punishing, but making it about lessons learned and how to avoid it in the future. So this one company had a lot of trouble about forgetting stuff to go on these long trips. So we created a checklist. So that checklist, they had to fill out that checklist and turn it in before they left. And sometimes they leave early in the morning, so there's just a little hanging thing on the wall. They can stick it in there, and the supervisor get it and see that they fill out their checklist, you see? Now, I haven't helped them if they falsified their checklist, because then there would be punishment. But that's part of life, part of life. Sometimes there has to be a, a negative address to certain behavior. But if you make it still about facts, data, not about personalities, it goes better. Okay, so we can see, any other questions on that point? We can see there's a greater breakout. So I agree that I would rather have seen this client break out uh, types of material more, and also so they can, and the reason I want them to break out their material more is so when they go to their vendors to get uh, competitive pricing, they know exactly how much they're spending for the vendor that provides plate steel, how much they're spending for uh, uh, vessel shells. It might be a different vendor. So they want to know how much they're spending so when they negotiate pricing, they have more ammunition to take with them to get the better preferred pricing. Okay, let's continue on. Look at the next page. And in this example, you see cost of uh, goods sold. It's broken out by types of labor, fabrication, field of construction, the, the uh, working foreman in this case, and the material costs are broken out here by different types, and uh, subcontractors are broken out to different types of subcontractors. You want to know how much you're spending on cranes, rather than just all subcontractors. What do cranes cost you every year? Well, if they cost you enough, maybe you want to buy your own crane, right? But you have to have some da data to support your decision. And that's one of the things that I try to teach them. You want to buy new equipment? How do you justify it based on costs, current costs versus savings if you bought it, what the return on investment period is, those type of things. Get them into the idea of using and investigating what those actual costs are, and then they'll make smarter decisions. And you can be a good guide for that, that process of getting started and keep them on track. So then uh, expenses, they're going to look a little bit more broken out than, than the accountant for tax purposes cares about. But for the business owner, he wants to know how his costs are breaking out. How much is he spending on his trucks? How much is he spending on computer systems? How much is he spending on IT support? Sometimes they find out it's ridiculous what they're really spending on IT support and why. Because whoever's in charge of it likes the IT guy. You know, so yeah, come on, come on. You know, truly, I mean, sometimes that's the real decision process rather than facts. So if you force the owner to look at these things, it's going to smack them in the face. Because believe you me, until they do this, they never believe it. They won't believe it until they can see, I don't have any work. But wait, wait, hardly ever. We do a breakdown. Well, how about $400,000? What? No. Well, oh, okay. Are you saying that you would actually go in and analyze, say, like the last two years' revenue and expenses to try and figure out the chart of accounts? Is that the approach? It's hard to go back to historical because if there's no breakout, it's really so time consuming to pull them out. You can do some of that. And if it's bad enough, I might go to the previous few months and actually do forensic to that detail. Because it's, it's in the accounting, but it takes a lot of sitting down with the foreman or the actual workers and actually, is this what I think it is? Because it just says expense.